Eh, vamos, ya que son las tres, voy a desactivar la sala de espera para que entren todos. Sonia, perdón, Dígame. hola. hola. Eh, una preguntita, ¿todo bien con los intérpretes? ¿Todo tranquilo? Súper, gracias. Sí, ningún problema. Gracias, gracias. Super. Vamos a dejarlos entrar. Hola, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a esperar un, un par de minutitos antes de comenzar, eh, esperando a que se, se nos una más, más gente. Bien, vamos a comenzar. Eh, vamos a ver. We'll start now. Primero que todo, eh, uh, first of all, good afternoon and thank you all for coming to this meeting. This is the second version of this seminar done within the context of the interoperability, transporter interoperability initiatives for Latin America and the Caribbean. This is a PAHO initiative based on our advancing in digital certificates. The, this particular PAHO initiative is framed within a series of initiatives that are taking place in the region, including the LACVAS initiative, which carries out similar activities as those that we're going to be doing, so we're going to be working together. And what we uh, hope to do with these presentations is to convey some of the necessary knowledge so that all the participating countries in the short run are able to generate a digital certificate. Initially, the DDCC certificate for which we'll make presentations every week on Thursdays at the same time. And we began these two weeks ago with, let me see, with the presentation on interoperability and standards in order to serve as an introduction for the context of the term of interoperability before we get into the actual digital certificates. Today's presentation is an introduction to HLS 7H -I F H I R on which the DCC certificates are based, and Alejandro Medina is in charge of this. He is a SENSE engineer certified by HL7 International. And the purpose of this is to deliver an approximation of the standard and advance in certain knowledge regarding the operations, the description, 
the way one can read the documentation and things like that, which are important at the beginning as an introduction. And then we'll continue in February with uh, Fernando Portilla's presentation, which is called H HPS in Action. It's also an introduction to HPS. And then we'll go on with another presentation, which is also an introduction to DCC. To continue in March in the actual generation of certificates from the data set explanations and the WHO's proposal with the installation and the server based on the interoperability standard like the HL7FHIR. And the purpose is to end in April with the generation of a certificate based on the documentation proposed by WHO's and WHO's standards. So with no further ado, to take advantage of our time in this meeting, I would like to give the floor to Alejandro Medina. We are having, hearing a, a, a bell in the background, which is very difficult to overcome when it interrupts the sound. Thanks. Continue, Alejandro. Creo que ahora sí. Ya. Por favor, me, me dicen Please si se... Tell me if you can see the screen correctly. Sí, se ve. Yes. Perfecto. Sí, ya, ok. Eh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es... Good afternoon, my name is Alejandro Medina. I'm the technical leader in implementations of SENSE, which is the national... Sensor, Center for Health Information Systems. And I'm going to begin with the introduction of the HLF, F, HER. And so those of you who have seen the FHIR, I'm going to explain some very simple concepts and we're going to show some of the documentation so that you can have a better understanding of what this standard means after the presentation we had a week ago where some of the details were given regarding FHIR, but now I'm going to go into it deeper so that we can have a better understanding of what the resources are and all the aspects of HL7 FHIR. The description here, as I said before, is an approximation to the standard with the purpose of your being able to understand and describe some general concepts of the standard and of course, understand its interoperability. I'm going to alternate between the standards page and the explanation. So hopefully we'll be going back and forth between these two screens. So let us see what is FHIR, the architectural principles of FHIR, how it was done, what it's based on. And the main subject, which are the resources, some of the exchange, of resource exchange methods, the data types, operations, and some terminology. I'm also going to talk briefly in the general introduction of the servers, just to help you understand the concept of an FHIR server. And of course, the idea is that you will be able to do some operations and discover yourselves all the advantages and find an appropriate use for FHIR. So what is the FHIR? It's a fast healthcare interoperability resource. These are rapid uh, resources making interoperability easier, taking concepts from the clinical side and changing it to a resource model. This version of the standard 
obviously was developed by HL7. Its first official vision, version was in 2014 when the development began. Actually, it began in 2011. The specification is based on restful practices. So for those of you who know the these uh, servers and its operation, this will be very easy. All you have to do is the resource concept, which is what changes. But the rest of the FHIR operations respect the standards guidelines. The idea is that FHIR is used by several providers. Clearly, the use as a whole can allow you to uh, apply a FHIR solution regardless of the context. The idea of the set of resources presented by this FHIR or the way of structuring the data is to cover several cases of use and common use, but it also provides certain elements allowing you to extend the standard. Solutions that don't necessarily have to adapt to all the FHIR guidelines, if they're not defined by the standard, one can extend them. And in this case, it, I'll explain some of the concepts later on. The idea is that we simplify the implementation without sacrificing the integrity of the solution. And FHIR takes advantage of all the logical models and those existing to supply consistent, easy, and rapidly implementable uh, objectives. It's That's the purpose. Use very few elements to use the technology with an easy implementation and as fast as possible, always uh, with iterations and so forth. But the idea is that the standard itself not become an obstacle or a delay when implementing it. One can use the independent data exchange standard together with other standards. In this case, FHIR is a syntactic definition of the information. The architectural principles, the reuse and makeup capacity. And I always repeat, this is the 80-20. In other words, 20% of the 20% of the attributes that can find solution to 80% of the cases. There's always going to be that gap. But it should uh, cover all cases, almost all cases, despite the 20%. The scalability, this comes from RESTful. These are uh, status, stateless transactions. And the performance is also based on the use of certain standards, and in this case, the JSON, XML, and others architectural principles. We always add others, but the main ones you'll see in FHIR will be JSON and XML. While in GB2, when using JSON, this is readable by humans. And that's uh, that's why it's use it's use that's that's its usability. And you can use clinical terminology. Uh, the resources support coding of some data. That's the, the faithfulness of the information and the implementability. There's a high adoption with FHIR. The FHIR are communities, if you wish. There are fora. There's a working group. There's a chat. It's a platform actually based on SUNY, for those of you who know it, where you can consult the creators of the standard themselves and the people that have greatest impact in certain changes in order to approach some cases of use, uh, local or international cases, or questions that are simple. The team is always available anyway through this community. And that helps us um, have a better understanding and deal with all the future changes of the standard. The current version is R4B. It's an intermediate version. Before we had the R4, and now this one, and then we'll have the R5 soon, which according to what I've heard, 
in the internet and the, page, the web pages, it will, around May, it will be coming out, the R5. But it was supposed to come out on 2022, so there is a certain delay there. The main purpose of HIR is to deal with interoperability through these structured data. And that's for all resources. The data models are simple and expressive. So we're going to find resources that truly represent the clinical data. And all of this is done through the efficient exchange mechanisms. The structure and the transaction forms are defined. However, there are several ways of communicating the resources. But first we have to understand what a resource is. Fundamentally, it's the basic interoperability uh, purpose. Everything is done through resources, and these resources are able to relate and establish a broader context of what one wants to communicate. Obviously, it represents concepts of the health world, um, accidents, and operations. Uh, the definitions are all in English, and it's not going to be too far. They're easy to understand. So I don't think that it will be a problem. These are common definitions. The resources are used in a simple manner, like one by one, or you can group them. In FHIR, it's possible to deal with other ways of communicating certain messages. You can replicate something similar to the B2, and something similar to the CDA. So there are specialized resources supporting the uh, sending of messages and the documents as well. Resources have certain common characteristics. There's a new RLA identifying the resources. It has a metadata section, as you see here. I hope you can see my uh, cursor. The metadata section is general information about the version, when was the last time it was updated, uh, the attributes representing an identity. In fact, this is the summary of the general reading. And then you have all the attributes here. In this case, we have a resource, which is a patient in the clinical context, which is a, case, a resource, patient who has a gender, a date of birth, and in this case, the record is active. If there's any data that cannot be simulated, it can be done through a certain section. All resources have an extension section where one can add elements or data that are not in the original resource. The resource exchange methods, uh, REST full API, which is the main one, messages, Ontario used messages in this case as reference. Documents, in this case, it's also supportable. Uh, implementation through services as well. And there is a way to store, of course, persistence based on the FHIR resources. The standard web. I hope you saw the standard web. I'm going to switch back and forth because I'm not going to be able to show you here any more information. And so I'm going to change. Can you tell me if you continue to see my screen? I seems I only shared the presentation. Can you see it? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, you see the welcome to FHIR. So this is the main page of the documentation, which has several different sections. Now. Interestingly, all the resources have their definition and the structures are all similar vis the distribution of the page elements. There are definitions for all types of readers. There are definitions or introductions for the clinical developers, architects. There are executive abstracts as well in case that they're necessary. And furthermore, we have the section of all resources, which is the basic unit. This list of resources you see here is enormous, as you see here when enlarge it a bit. All of these have different uses, and they're 
clearly some clinical, some baseline, and some are included basically in that they're necessary for the transmission of the information. There are resources that have to do with the financial aspects, and there are some specialized ones that can be used for research or for other more specific elements or uses. And if you go to documentation, as I am here now, you find here types of resources, and you can find each particular resource that you want. I'm going to go, I'm going to continue with the patient, but in this definition, you're going to be seeing the same screen through all resources. And we have examples, de detailed descriptions, some mapping, some profiling, extensions, extending the use of a resource. All of this is specific of one resource. You have the context and the way it should be used, the summary, the description, an index, a table of context showing the maturity of the resource. This is very important because it indicates whether it's a resource that has been worked with extensively or it's one that's just beginning and still has not been used much and could change in the future. In this case, we're seeing a resource with the letter N, which in fact, for the maximum maturity level, which is normative, this is not gonna be changing, but there's a scale of one to five in the maturity of the resources. If we're interested in knowing the maturity of the standard, we can also get to that. This is public and this includes all this information. We can see the whole level of maturity and the definition and what each one of the elements mean. We can see the references and what are the uh, references for these resources. We can see that all or most of the resources have some relationship with the patient, of course, the clinical context. The patient definition, we have all the patient's information and they all have some meaning without even rereading the description, one can begin to understand the data they represent. Here, obviously, we do not include the extensions. I think that later on, we're going to be able to explain the details of these actions and profiles. There are definitions. If you're interested in the XML, you have the same definition in XML if it's familial, if you're familiar with JSON, and there are others like turtle or others. There also has elements of terminology all the patient's information or attributes that have some relationship with any type of terminology, their constraints or rules in this case. And finally, it shows how, of course here, this is the general information, but at the end of all the resources, you're going to find a section called search parameters. And probably when using FHIR, these are going to be very useful. It shows how I can search the resource. Later, I'm gonna show you some examples just to give you an idea of some of the details. Obviously, it shows what it means, what we're looking for, what expression is going to be used to do the search. I'll return to the presentation now. The baseline resources, as you see, have different attributes, but each one of these is represented by a data type. For example, the gender is represented by a primitive data, data type. There are other data like uh, contact or name, which are of a general purpose. They're complex data and they are made up of several primitive data. Then the metadata, type, which is the traditional metadata, and then the special purpose type. These are references, goals, extensions, special purpose data, which have no relationship with the clinical context, but do extend the use of the resource. Here is a little larger image. All the information here was taken from the web, and I'll show you in a minute where that can come from. In resources, any resource, I can go to documentation and find that. 
or in this case, I can find the type of data and I can see the same image. Each data type has its definition. The page or the standard in this case is self-explanatory. If I need to know something, probably I'll find it here. If, for example, I wanna know what I mentioned about the name, I go to the definition of human name, which is the name here, and there's a problem with the page. Yes, it's taking me to He's looking for the page. Oh, here we go. This is the definition of the type of data. So saying that the human name has use, a text, which is the complete representation, the family name, which in this case would be the last name, the surname, or the family name, the given, which is the representation of all the patient's name, the prefix in case it's necessary, and a validity period in case the name only is used only for a given period of time. And you can see all these elements on all the definitions of the different types of uh, data, and the, the, the addresses are a type of data that are represented by all the elements that would be required to represent an address in this case. Each data type has its definition and description even the primitive data have their own definition. Okay. Now, the profiles. So what is a profile? Usually the solutions, and I hear in this presentation, I believe there's a mistake. It says the resources don't always adapt 100%. Generally, I've never seen a case like that where you adapt a resource 100% with any change. Usually when there's a solution, there are data that we're either not going to use from a resource or data that are missing in the resource. So the way uh, FHIR can allow the implementers and developers add these fields by extensions or constraints and obviously by adding certain rules to the resource. The fact is that with this, one would have to formalize the changes. And the way to do that registration or formalization is usually with profiles. So the profile in the end is the formalization of all the changes done in a resource so I can have the original patient as the basic resource, and then I can have a profile of the patient, which is specifically for the case of use that I'm giving it. And obviously, the profiles have a structure. There is a resource allowing to define the resources, which is called structure definition. So we were seeing the operations as well. Obviously, these are based on REST. So to create the elements, we're gonna use the POST, and we're gonna use the CAT, the PUT, the PAT, and to eliminate the utility method. So how do we do it? Obviously, you have to have the endpoint of the server, and from there, structure accessing each one of the resource paths and being and be able to do the operations. Obviously, I think this is an introduction. Very clear. So I'm gonna to try to change it if we have time. Very clearly, we cannot necessarily, well, we can obtain one element or several. So it can support different types of searches. It does not, allow for sending out a new element. So here we have an example, we have a patient and with post and respecting the structure, we could create a new element. Updating in this case, we need to look at put, which are complete updates, but then we also have a patch 
for partial inclusion of data. We can have a resource with incremental data so we can update the data. This is part of the rules as well. I also have delete, which allows us to delete a file. Now, here are some of the different examples of operations that can take place with fire. There's create, there's read, update, search. We always need to include the resource type and the search parameters. It's possible to see prior resources. We can look at the history. We can also undertake transactions. So if we need multiple resources, we can send out a transaction of several resources with different operations. In addition, there are certain operations that allow for actions on certain resources, for instance, having summaries or all of the data that exists, say on a given patient, transformation into document. Now these definitions are on the standards page. Here I will show you the definitions of the standards. Here we have how to validate resources. This is very important. And here it is. Here the idea is to validate in relation to a profile. So it includes all of the elements that the resource will have. And then by validating, I can create a data structure according to the rules that were included in the profile. FIRE also allows for semantic interoperability and includes terminology which can be added. We have a code system which allows for greater ease in order to have a complete code system. Now the value set, now this goes to the code system and there's a concept map and here it's possible to define mapping of a value set defined by a code system to another, Speci specifying the type of equivalence, very common with a concept map. If you want to include some kind of rule-based data, for instance, uh, something that we see in Chile, the number of codes for gender. So here, what's often useful is to have a concept map. So we have the definition, and then we have the different types of equivalences. <coughs> now, the FHIR server, the FHIR server, this is the first cycle. And here the idea is to understand that when we talk about a FHIR server, it can either completely or partially implement the definition of the standard. It does not need to support everything included in the standard, but it must respect the rules. Now, some support different versions of the standard, different versions of FHIR. Others support validation with profiles. Others don't support profiles. So it's not a sin that not everything be included. So when you want to implement a service or when you go to fire, you can adapt the rules <clears throat> and you don't need to include absolutely everything indicated by fire in terms of functionalities. Very clearly, 
there are some things defined by the standard and others not. Basic operations of the server operations, versions, validation of resources, transactions, operations, searches, capability statement, which we're going to look at in a minute, and we can look at the history. Now, maybe there's a server that has no history. That could happen. Nor do we need support for all of the resources. Now, we're going to look at the capability statement and see how that works in practice. This is part of the rules established by a fire server. One needs to be aware of them. Now, there could be a server that supports certain interactions. There may be interactions that affect the entire server, or there may be those that only affect a certain type of resource. <coughs> and there are interactions that will only support a specific resource. For instance, to create an element, this is an interaction that goes to the type of resource. Let's say a new patient, and then this can be created here as a base type. And if I go to something specific, I will go to the instance. And if I want to do a search on metadata, for instance, it would be a general operation on the resource affecting everything. Here, I will stop for a minute. Here we go. I hope that you can see this. <clears throat> I hope so. Yes. So here, patient, what we're looking at standard R4. This is a public server. I, if I go to the root, it takes me to the main screen and it says this is the base URL at fire without supporting any operation, unable to handle this request. And then I need to look at the resources specifically. If I'm looking at a patient, it's going to give me a list of all of the patients on this server. This is an interaction. Now, then I can go and search for a specific element. And this is going to looking for something specific, which has been added. Now, what does this resource offer in general? It has a narrative. It has extensions. of US core, everything related to race. It has identifiers, a name, a surname. Tyler would be the given name. So this is an example of a resource of a patient. And on this, I can undertake different operations. I can replace, I can delete. It's a public server and anything can happen. So we're just using test data on the public server for now. We're not even including data you may wish to eliminate. It's data that then becomes not available. Now, what is it that we can see? 
Now we look at the capacities of the server. And here on the server, with this operation, with metadata or capabilities data, I can see the capacity of the server. I have the general information and we can see what it can do and what it can't do. Origin licensing, open source software we see here. It's a happy fire server and we see the version 6.5 and it implements standard for a one. If we have any questions about this version, we can see the information on the standard and we can go to that line. Four oh one. So this is release four, the first normative content. And here I can look at the de definition. And here I can look at the standard. I can see the definition. I can see the resources. And so I can see that the information I have here will be seen on the patient's file over here. And we have the capability statement which gives us information on the formats. And here we have the different formats. There are patch formats as well. And also important, here we have it. Now, what are the resources it supports? One is called account, which supports the following interactions, which are defined under the profile. It also supports all these interactions, search, update, read, and patch. I can see history types, I can eliminate, delete. These are other elements, which has to do with conditional creations. We also have search. I'm going to look at the search parameters. So I can filter. I can look either by owner, by identifiers, period. So this definition can be extended to all of the resources that are supported. So here, we're looking at activity definition. It's another resource. And I will show you some. So here are some additional resources under type. I'll try to go directly into type patient. So we have the basic profile, which supports all of these profiles. Based on the patient, we have interactions, which are the same ones we saw. And we also have the parameters, which are important. Here we go. We can look by DOB. We can see, in this case, the patient is deceased. We can look at address, gender. So a simple search, gender search. So if I want to know a little bit more, here it says gender, but I don't know what to search for. So I'm going to have to look for a value. So I can look to the standard directly and I will go to gender. And here, patient gender and the resources. I go to the resource. 
and I can look f male, female, other, or unknown. So I'm going to go to male or female, we do a search, and we can filter among the patients, all of the male patients. I get a list. of patients who have a defined gender as male. Here we're looking at female. Or I can also filter using other variables. So the idea the idea is that this is somewhat general. If you want to look at specific definitions of the standard, what I haven't included in this presentation, you can go to the documentation section, and there you can see the interactions, the RESTful. And you can see more formal definitions, which go to the behavior of the server. And it will indicate how I can filter how I want to receive the information, or if I want a summary, if I want different versions, if I'm the implementer, how I can implement this function, and if I'm consulting, then I am the client in this case of the server, and how to use this for consulting, so long as it's supported by the server. Now, what are the different types of servers? Some are generic that implement the standard almost in its entirety. And it may need to be limited. There's also the Happy Fire, which has all of its resources limited. For instance, limiting to the resources that I require. Usually, the user needs to install. No, it can also work with containers. It supports different databases. In the case of Smile, a Paho server. And Pajo also has Happy Fire. And there's also Firely, which also provides certain functionalities. No, there's the case of those that have Fire implemented. There's also an IBM server. IBM Fire Server, which can support all of the standards. And there are specific servers that only apply part of the standard. No. Firely has certain libraries. very clearly. The idea is that the developer needs to implement everything. Now there's also open source, others require payment, and they all have libraries for consultation. How to implement a fire server? It could be implemented as a facade, and it doesn't interoperate with anything, there can be a fire server with a facade and implementing all of the different elements. And it can all be translated into resources and the client can consult what is behind it. And the client can go to fire with a facade And so in this way, we can interoperate with different data. There's an intermediate API 
this is a server between the client and the server, and it's possible to interpret information in two directions between fire and the client. And it may have persistence, but it can go in two ways. There is also an API, which is a facade with the client. It, the client, it depends on whether the client can communicate with fire. It wasn't clear if it was possible or not. But the idea is that there can be communication with between the client and fire. So this can all be implemented. Now, what are the different fire servers? There's a Pascal server with everything implemented. There's also Firely with its library. There's Smile CDR, which is the commercial version of Happy Fire and it does support it all. There's Spark, C Sharp. This is a version that they created. There's also a Java server, IBM Fire server. It's another option for open source. There's, S, there's C Cyro which is more useful when it comes to terminology. There's also another alternative. And we also have Microsoft that has a certain definition for API for Fire. An API solution for Fire is integrated today. with all of its technologies. And the same for Google. Now, it may, may be a question of taste. Now, and also applying international standards and integration with all of the internal tools. So these are different options. Now, Azure has a price list, which is a bit different, but it's a question of checking it out. If you want to see the list of public servers, there is a list of these that you can use as public test services if you want to practice with the standard. When you have this, well, you can go to this link, which is the public test server. And before concluding, You may have some questions on the presentation, or you may have questions on the standard. So there are many topics with the short time we have. Thank you, Alejandro. Are there any questions? There seems to be a hand up. Do you think FIRE is a solution for aggregated data or only at the level of disaggregated data? Or is there a FIRE implementation that can be used for interoperability of aggregated or added data. I would need more information. For instance, vaccination for all of the different patients. 
or maybe when you need another level of care. And non nominal resources. Could this be done with fire or would it be better to use some other form of transfer? Now, if the data is in a repository, if it exists, in this case, there could be an interface for the consultation of this data. There we had different options. We could have a facade server. If you need to use it. Now, the advantage of using the standard it, one can with limited documentation, any person or client or any client application wanting to consult the data and is familiar with FHIR will be able to increase the velocity of integration. So we cannot put aside the standards. This is one of the main advantages it has. Alguna otra pregunta? Are there any other questions? Mientras tanto, comentarles. So, meanwhile, I would like to say that we've recorded the presentation and that will be shared. And we have a link that we put on the chat that goes to the community for FIRE and the different projects in different countries. Sonia, I have something to add uh, related to disaggregated data. One way of supporting this operation would be by going to the defined operations, operations defined by resource type. Now, we could have other operations included here, number, summary, generation of report. We could add new things here. So we could use a profile, but we go to operation definition. And so we could use existing data. It can be done. It's a wide and flexible standard in this case, so that we can include all different types of new solutions with existing data. Thank you. Very well, if there are no further questions, we have concluded with the presentation and we invite you to our meeting next Thursday at 3 p.m. We'll be presenting on IPS and in regard to questions, installation, testing, we will see that. And so we will continue with these presentations. And in March, we have scheduled a presentation on installation and we'll see a bit more on how to use the servers. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us and we will see one another again next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes.